trying to do something here in Strand, but I kind of want more. I want, I was going to say more ammunition, that's from that. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want to be that powerful. I want to be as powerful as Monsanto and BP. Um, you know, how do I do that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for the adversary attack, that, so if, uh, if you think that those would be effective, you know, using language would be effective. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, this book uh, made me make a film, so I, I, understand, mm -hmm. I understand the power of language. Yeah. Um, I just don't see people in the first world giving up their comforts, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the, the hardest things to accept. Mm -hmm is I think we all, not we all, but a lot of people on the left and environmental movement sort of fetishize this idea of a, of a great glorious mass movement that will bring us to victory and I just don't see that happening. Uh, there are certainly ruptures and, uh, and, and, and positive developments, like I think the Occupy movement is a, is a very hopeful thing, mm. um, but their, their focus right now is, is the economy and you know there can't be any economy if there's no nature and I think that's mm. one of the things that uh, I, I would love for them to evolve to that point and recognize that nature is primary. Um, but, and, and you know, I, I have a lot of respect, respect for Starhawk, um, but you know, try telling that to uh, Palestinian uh, mm -hmm. people who have been, you know, who are, who are murdered, you know, on a mm -hmm. on a yearly basis and who are basically living in a in a massive prison. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think maybe in some contexts like that, that those things could work, but you know. In others, yes, it doesn't. There was a um, very conservative uh, Christian gentleman by the name of Wego, Wego Ludwig, um, and he moved his uh, his Christian commune to the northwest uh, side of uh, Alberta. And you know, I don't I don't really see eye to eye with his conservative Christians values and, and, and with his lifestyle, but you know, they chose to live off the land, had their commune there, and the um, gas company started drilling around his area, and first uh, some of his livestock started to have stillbirths, and then a couple of women in the commune uh, had stillbirths as well, including one baby who was born without a skull. Mm -hmm. And they tried everything. They tried petitioning the government. They tried talking directly to the corporations, and you know there was no there was no response. Uh, and so he started blowing up the pipelines. <laughs> and it, it's not to say that that was like the the, the most effective strategy, but he certainly um, was trying to protect what you know what he thought was his and um, his. Uh, there's a great film about it called uh, Weibo's War, um, in which you know they document their whole struggle themselves, and um, they had that famous shot that everybody knows now these days of people turning on the tap, the water, mm -hmm. and setting it on fire. You know that was happening to uh, over there as well, and so yeah, I think that it would be nice if we could just have a very pacifist and non-violent resistance, but I just don't think that in this particular context, it's, it, 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 some of that could work, but I don't think it, entirely the resistance is going to have to do other things as well. And um, and I know we've sort of beaten uh, the same point over and over again, but uh, there's plenty of good work that needs that, 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 that can be done to support uh, uh, movements of resistance. Uh, so it's not like everybody has to be involved in that, in that sort of type of stuff. But at least support it, or if you don't support it, uh, at least don't condemn it. You know. Yep. Um, I found your film very um, challenging. It made me think a lot. Um, one of the things that troubles me is my scant knowledge of history. There seems to be a lot more examples I can think of where mm -hmm. resistance movements have eventually led to the next sociopath taking over, um, thinking of Stalin, Mao. Mm. Um, and that doesn't encourage me to um, entertain following a path where my actions don't reflect my values. Mm. Um, and it, I mean, it may be just my 
my fear talking, but I think it's I think there's more than that. Mm -hmm. I think there's, yeah. Um, this, yeah, it's, it's not just my fear for myself, although well, that's there, mm -hmm. of course, but this fear that um, a resistance movement can become a vehicle for some very dysfunctional kind of new oppressive mm -hmm. um, power structures. Yeah, I certainly understand that fear. And um, <coughs> I'm an anarchist, so I don't believe in the state. Um, and I would love to see the state completely done away with uh, and power uh, um, returned to local communities in a super, in a super ultra local way. Uh, because I think this is part of our problem where we have people hundreds and sometimes in the case of the United States, thousands of miles, of miles away making decisions uh, and of course completely bought out by corporations as is the case right now. Um, I think that a lot of those uh, examples that you gave are of um, political movements that wanted to reproduce the state in a different way. And I think that's cert certainly part of the problem there is that, you know, they, they didn't want capitalism or they didn't want the czar or whatever it was, uh, yeah. but they did want to take the power and create another centralized reproduction of it with different values and whatnot. And, um, uh, yeah, we haven't had a successful anarchist revolution yet, but certainly <laughs> there were really good examples about what's possible in the Spanish Civil War and how people uh, organize themselves horizontally. Uh, um, and uh, did away in many cases with money uh, and certainly um, uh, did away with patriarchy, uh, uh, did everything they could to make everything um, equal. Um, and uh, more recently, I think uh, one of the best, better examples of something that has happened in the past 10 or 15 years is uh, the people of Bougainville who um, it's, a, it's an island uh, in the South Pacific who had, uh, I think they're, they were part of Papua, Papua New Guinea. And Papua New Guinea was sending uh, mining corporations to, this, you know, to mine and therefore destroy the land. And they launched an armed rebellion, kicked out the Papua New Guinea government, also kicked out the, uh, the mining corporations, and also kicked out the mercenaries that were hired by the mining corporations to, to protect to, to protect the uh, the mine, and uh, it's what's called the first like eco eco revolution, where these folks uh, are independent uh, by the fact that they kicked out the Papua New Guinea government, uh, don't have the economic inputs that they gave them, so they have created you know their own society, uh, democratic society uh, that's very aware of their resources because they. Oh, excuse me. Um, uh, they have to live sustainably because they're, they're in an island, so they, you know, they can't just chop down all the trees and whatnot. And they've, been, they've done some really neat things with coconut oil, and uh, there's a great film about it called The Coconut Revolution. So, yeah, looking at history is super important so that we don't make the same mistakes of the past. But that's not to say that um, uh, having um, a militant struggle always leads to these things because that, I don't think that's always the case. I think part of the reason is the political ideologies that drive these revolutionary struggles. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of picking up a lot, uh, a lot of what you're saying and I can share it. I think the, the film was provocative and, and it sort of posed more questions than it offered answers. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, so you know, about you know, where does violence sit in any kind of you know, political struggle. But, but I, I'm really grateful for being re reminded that the that it is a political struggle, struggle and of the highest uh, stakes. And we're probably all, and I count myself primarily on this, naive to think that it, whether we intended violence or not, there wouldn't be violence, you know, part of the if we were really threatening the power structures that you know perpetuate the you know the ecological crisis. We would be naive if we're not if they're not confronting us. Then we're not doing it right. Probably we're actually we're still playing games mm -hmm. because this is serious stuff. You know we have to be all grown up. 
and that probably involves us being, you know, a lot tougher. We're nice people, we want to do good things, but actually we're going to have to get a whole lot, lot tougher quite quickly. So I, re I appreciate that. Another, another slight sort of, uh, almost like sort of exponential thing was I was sitting here and thinking, few sequences in this film are thinking if two, some of the language was slightly changed, maybe we were sitting here and we were of the Muslim faith a few years ago, we would have been under surveillance for sitting in here. And that's kind of interesting, I'm just going to leave that little hanging in there slightly, you know, because I think that's actually, you know, that's kind of a curious, I just had that feeling, just kind of mm -hmm. that sense watching it. Okay, I was Muslim and I was sitting here, maybe in Bradford or something, or maybe five years ago, we'd be, you know, we'd be subject to, you know, surveillance, I think, almost certainly, <coughs> watching a film like that. If some of the language is quite changed. And we could well be now, in fact. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it matters if if your activism is not doing the most militant stuff, you are you are you are gonna be under the watchful eye of the state. Mm -hmm. And the ex <coughs> the examples abound and I think Britain is probably like one of the most surveilled places in the world. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we always have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, even Quaker groups in the United States were infiltrated, you know, you know, pacifist and like nice uh, pacifist people. So it, um, anything that sort of challenges the legitimacy of the state and their actions and, and of the corporations by extension is always going to be, you know, in the crosshairs of, of those who want to remain in power. But with that said, um, I think that the idea of the all-knowing, all-seeing, uh, uh, um, security apparatus that you know there's there's nothing that we can put past them because they just know everything is uh, counterproductive is not realistic and sometimes I think we give them too much credit and yeah every so often you see examples on how people with very little resources again uh, are able to outsmart and outwit the security apparatus and then do really spectacular things so I'm gonna say a little, a little bit adding to that sorry I've had to run away and miss some of the conversation but I don't think I'll be repeating anything with this so there's two